Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How's your mouth? Well, by God, it's great. I broke another tooth. What the I told fuck you that today. I spent doing? the entire morning in the dentist office. Uh, yeah, Dr. Simon took really good care of me. But yeah, I, I, I'm beginning to think that the years of self abuse, not that kind of self abuse, but uh, I just think the years of abuse have finally, they're, they're catching up on me. And what the fuck? Hey, real question What is it when, when people go back to work for Titan Sports? Everybody has dental issues. Fucking Eric Bischoff, you've been back now twice. Everybody's got dental situations as soon as they sign back up. Does McMahon have like the best dental care around or what's the deal? Well, I, I don't really know because I had I had my dental issues. Well, you know what? Actually, no, it came back when I did come back. That's that's pretty fucking accurate. Um I just think it's something in the water. Yeah, something in the water it is. And I'm excited because there's apparently something in the water today. We're talking about one of our most requested shows ever this Tuesday in Texas. A rare look at a show when Bruce Pritchard was not under the employ of WWE, but he was technically at this show. So we'll get into that and a lot more. So Bruce, we're doing this watch along style. We hope everyone at home has got their WWE network fired up. This is going to be eons shorter than when we had to review the train wreck that was Halloween Havoc 1998, which I know a lot of you are still listening to because it's that long. This one's only an hour and 33 minutes. So we're going to have, uh, an opportunity to really play the hits. I'm looking forward to this one, Bruce. Do you want to give everybody a countdown? And then when you say play, we'll press play. I will do it. I've got it all zeroed out. Tuesday in Texas, 1991, December 3rd, 1991. TV 14 V for violence of 1991. It was a different time and a different era. So I'm going to say five, four, three, two, one. And then I'm going to say play. When I say play, we're all going to hit that magic button in the middle of the screen and go. So here we go. In five, four, three, two, one, play. All right, folks, we are here in the catacombs, the bowels, if you will, of the Joe Lewis Arena in Detroit, Michigan, where The Undertaker has just defeated Hulkamania. And you, Mr. Bear, you have declared that Hulkamania, as we know it, is now dead. Oh, yes, Mean Gene. Oh, yes, Hulkster will not pose anymore. He has gone on to another life, but the services are not finished. They will end right here tonight in Texas. Oh, yes, where my under Baker will deliver last rites. Oh, yes, you big yellow tan and red motherfucker, you. <laughs> oh, man, that's so good. You know, it's fun that we're watching this, too, because we just recently, most of us at least, had a chance to catch uh, Steve Austin talking to The Undertaker here on the network and they talk so much about the early days of the undertaker, and this is really shitting and getting as a reminder, the undertaker beat Hulk Hogan for the world title. I'll take a look at this. Look into the coffin, Mr. Cool. Okerlund. It's phenomenal. What a great shot. Very well done here. They're talking about, you know, Hulkamania being in this coffin from survivor series. Of course. We've covered Survivor Series 1990 in our archives. Be sure to check that out at somethingtowrestle.com. But one year later, one year after the debut of the character, he beats Hulk Hogan for the world title, which is really only an honor that had been bestowed to one other man, the Ultimate Warrior, back at WrestleMania 6 in 1990. So, you know, you, you roll through those championship years, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, and the first major loss that Hogan suffers for the title you know, besides the whole dispute with, uh, the double referee thing on NBC is a pinfall loss to the ultimate warrior. And now again, here in 1991 with the undertaker and man, look at this. What a great treat. I feel bad that we're talking over gorilla monsoon and Bobby, the brain. This is my favorite 
duo of WWF commentators in history. I think it's a lot of people's favorite duo. You know, you go back and for all time fans, it was either Jesse and Vince or Bobby and gorilla. I mean, I really yeah. enjoyed gorilla and, and, and Jesse as well, but there's something about Bobby Heenan that especially I think there is a, a whole group of guys who are like my age and we've just sort of grown into appreciating the greatness of Bobby Heenan, you know, that maybe we didn't pick up on as a kid because we were just cheering for our favorites. But as an adult, man, you can't help, but look at what this guy was doing and think nobody was at his level. No, Bobby was, I think amongst his peers as well, longtime fans. They have always looked at Bobby Heenan as being the greatest manager of all time. And no one living today, in my opinion, would dispute that from a working standpoint and just being able to get talent over his own as a heel. He was able to get baby faces over in a big way by putting them over and knocking them at the same time, knocking them in a negative, positive way. That it was an art form for someone that truly got it. Bobby was a master of that. And man, when I think about intercontinental champions, I know a lot of people think of Bret Hart as the world champion and I certainly get that. But to me, I'll always think of him as my intercontinental champion. He was my favorite as an intercontinental champion. He beat at SummerSlam earlier this year, 1991, Mr. Perfect for that belt. And it was such a great match. You know, I really felt like Mr. Perfect was in a league of his own and he had been well-established with the big streak. And then after that night with Brett, Brett was a made man, you know, winning the belt in Madison square garden with his parents watching on just a few months later here, he's going to be defending the title against Skinner. And, uh, Skinner, somebody we haven't spent a lot of time talking about here on the show. Tell everybody about the man behind the character. Well, my first impression when I look back at Steve Kern during this, this time was here was a guy, watch this little girl. She's just beside herself. Oh my God. Probably still has those glasses. And Brett would sign everyone, date it, you know, where they were in the town. It was pretty cool. Oh, that is cool. Um, I didn't know he signed and dated them. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. He signed and dated them, you know, and put the arena and all that stuff in there. So it, it was special. It was a keepsake, I think, for everybody. And that was Brett's little touch Very made well a difference. Done. Very well done. But, but Steve Kern, man, Steve was always a, a guy who had throughout his career – he had pretty much played the the good looking, handsome, young, fiery baby face stud. And to see Steve in this incarnation with the flannel and the big beard and, and scruffy hair and chewing the tobacco was this is more true of the human being, Steve Kern. Uh, but the other the other incarnations that people had seen him throughout his career is one of the fabs with Stan Lane. You know, he would come to the ring in bow tie and top hat and a sequin tuxedo top and all the girls would go crazy, bleach blonde hair. And then to go into this incarnation, I thought was, I just thought it was great because this was just closer to the human being Steve Kern than any of the other ones. It's interesting that, uh, you know, after, and I think that's been really probably looked over more than maybe it should have been, but this guy is a member of the fabulous ones. And if you don't, if you're a younger fan, you don't really know that name, or maybe you weren't a territory guy, go throw it in your Google machine, take a look at what that is, and then come back and remember, Hey, this is Skinner, which is just unbelievable. We should mention that, um, he started training wrestlers even back in the late eighties, even before, um, you know, he was finished wrestling as he's wrestling Brett here. He's 40 years old. And by this point, he's already training guys and he's, he, he's responsible for helping train guys like, uh, Mike awesome, uh, Dennis Knight, who we know is, um, you know, a member of, of many factions, including the Godwins. It, most of us remember him as Phineas, uh, diamond Dallas page trained with him and Dustin Rhodes trained with him and even Tracy smothers. But even the WWE looked to him, uh, once upon a time, he was uh, a big part of Florida championship wrestling. I think he was, I mean, that was his school. That was his, his whole shooting match, right? Yeah. Steve was definitely a big part of the developmental program early on and the precursor to NXT and the performance center, center, what it is now. Um, 
started out as Board of Championship Wrestling with Steve at the helm. But Steve was just a tremendous worker and a good guy that when he met with Vince, you talk about these occupational gimmicks sometimes. This Skinner, Steve Kern would go out and Steve would have the license to hunt gators in Florida. And certain times of the year, they would declare that you could hunt gators. And I think everybody could get two. And, and Steve would get people to get licenses and take them on a gator hunt. Now, if you had never been on a gator hunt, that's kind of a scary thing. I actually wanted to do it with him one time and just never got the chance to do it. But if they didn't want to kill the gator or not, they could at least be on the hunt. Steve would do it for them. And that would be just more either meat or hide uh, for Steve. Steve would give them one and he would keep one. Um, but he just loved his gator hunting. I think that if, <laughs> if you were to get down to it and say, Steve, what do you want to do all day long? Um, you probably have one answer. And then the other one would be hunting gators. What, what would the first one be? I'll wrestle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like blue chew wrestling. What, what the hell did you, what the hell did you think I was? Well, I thought since you were talking about how you'd abused your body, it may have been puff, puff pass. And then I thought of our sponsors. No, we should mention. Well, you, you probably should have thought of the sponsors first. Yeah. Well, they're, they're cracking down on me. They, they, they think I got a little I know. out of pocket on, on some of the language I was using on the blue chew ads. Well, we're, we're cleaning it up a little bit. No, it still listen, works. But, still. No, yeah, listen, blue chew works like to the point where, well, I'll tell you a story off air, but a friend of ours is having a lot of fun. <laughs> um, we should mention, as you said, at the top of the show, December 3rd, 1991 Freeman Coliseum. We're in San Antonio, Texas. There's about 8,000 fans here. The reason this show has not already been covered by us, because this is definitely my shit, boy. I love this era. You weren't here for this. Now, technically you're in the building, but this is when I think, I think Vince called this your hiatus. Is that right? Yes. This was, uh, my first hiatus, not fired just on hiatus. I got to tell you, it's, uh, it's pretty surreal to think about the fact that you're no longer on hiatus and you're, you're there. I got to send you a picture later that I, uh, have in my phone of you and Vince that pretty cool shot. Oh my. Let's talk about, uh, this interesting concept here. There's been plenty of time for us to talk about this, but very unique opportunity. This, this show is called two, uh, you know, Tuesday, this Tuesday in Texas, you guys would try this again years later, by the way, what a shitty fucking name. Well, okay. Let's talk about it. I don't think it's that shitty of a name because well, once upon a time, you guys were calling a show Friday night, Smackdown, and you were used to call a show Monday night raw. I feel like putting when it is matters and you're doing this on a short turn that we're only six days removed from survivor series. So very much a traditional pay-per-view survivor series, 1991. I think most people, uh, are used to that, uh, concept happening on uh, Thanksgiving, this is actually Thanksgiving Eve. So it's one day sooner than normal. And you decide to run a bit of a test. Of course, historically pay-per-views were on the weekend. Survivor series was the exception. You decide to try a Tuesday or the company decides to try a Tuesday pay-per-view, which they would try more than a decade later for taboo Tuesday with a totally different concept, but still a Tuesday pay-per-view. Now the dynamic years later made sense because you've got the go home show the night before on raw where you can really hammer and two days before on Sunday night heat where you can really hammer and say, don't forget, don't miss it. Or your syndicated shows, whatever you had, this is different. You know, you had survivor series happen on a Wednesday. You had your syndicated shows air over the weekend. Monday night raw doesn't exist. And you're trying a Tuesday pay-per-view. How far back had Vince wanted to try a weekday pay-per-view as opposed to a weekend. I, I can't really answer that. I, I don't know. And I do know after the fact, kind of the philosophy behind it was experimental to try to do something off of 
the controversy of the one pay-per-view to go the next week utilizing only your syndication shows to promote it on that Saturday and Sunday all across the country and to do a concentrated ad buy effort uh, within your cable properties and every place that you could to try and promote this Tuesday in Texas. And I, I was actually kind of joking about what a shitty fucking name, but as you stated, it was really a genius name because it just told you what was happening and where hey, and folks, when the whole deal, everything this Tuesday in Texas, and then all your sub plot and everything else was underneath that, you know, Hulk Hogan tries to avenge losing the WWF championship. Um, but, but again, in the promos that weekend, normally you've got a three month build or a four month build where you'd say at the survivor series, dude, there's more of a runway for that on a short runway like this in every promo. It was this Tuesday in Texas. I mean, it told right. you fucking no, no, not a month from now, not three weeks from now. Don't mark your calendar. Motherfucker. It's this Tuesday in Texas. It's great. It's urgent. You got, you know, and I think just the, by doing it that way that you felt, Oh my God, I've got to see this. I can't miss it. It's this Tuesday. There's an urgency to it. And um, I really, you know, I don't know how well it did reality-wise. But at the same time, it was an interesting experiment. And I think if it had done, probably if it had done really well, they would have done more of them. Right. There's your answer. So it, it was that, an that's answer. your answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, listen, in those, in those days, it's always hard to sort of pin down a number. We will talk about you know, what the buy rate was, but the, the concept is definitely interesting. And, and I think it's cool, you know, that they were willing to step out and try something. And as a kid, I absolutely loved it. Now did, uh, pop, pop buy this for you, Larry Thompson, oh, yeah. not pop, pop, not by, you know, pop, pop was there. Yeah. Pop, um, pop, pop pops here. This is back yeah. when he was still showing up to events. Uh, yep. but no, he, he, uh, my dad definitely bought this for me because I was a little Hulkamaniac that's been well-established on the show. I could not believe the goddamn undertaker beat him. You know, we finally got the ultimate warrior out of the way, but now this new monsters here, we got to get rid of him. So I did not miss it. And there'll be lots to talk about with that. I think the backstory with our main event is just phenomenal. By the way, the match that we're watching now. Uh, Dave Meltzer would write in his observer is uh, a decent opener. And he gave it two and a quarter star. He would critique the match by saying it started out kind of slow since Skinner is pretty well past washed up, but Brett carried it to a decent match with a lot of near falls towards the end before Skinner took a bump off the top rope and submitted to the sharpshooter, which they're definitely establishing as a real finishing maneuver. You know, God damn, they're having a hell of a match. No, no, I agree. I, I just think, you know, Meltzer has his favorites and, for whatever reason, he thinks that when any wrestler turned 40, they were old, except for Ric Flair. And then when he was phenomenal, at 40, or Ishimashi, Koshi, Zuwa, Fujiwara, Snavis Chase is I, the case. I just think it's fascinating that, you know, the way we perceive age in wrestling has changed so much, you know, like once upon a time, you know, it was, oh, he's 40. He's in, he's elderly. But that wasn't the case a generation before the observer, because guys were wrestling well into their fifties and it hasn't been the case in the, in what the last 15 years, guys are wrestling well past maybe 20 years. Absolutely. And I think that that just, you know, is a testament to the caliber of athlete that is competing, that they've been able to go that long and, and the money God, you know, to, the, the, the to money think is, at 40, he's washed up. Right. Hmm. You know, now's the time where everybody wants me to remind you how old AJ Styles is, but you already know he's 42. He's a kid. No, I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying the idea that we're saying Skinner's passed up and he's literally two years younger than AJ is now. And everybody's like, well, AJ is one of the you know best wrestlers of all time. And I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing that. AJ said his prime. He's young. You know, Daniel Bryan is 38 years old and in two years, that dude ain't washed up. Come on. Yeah, he was washed up about five years ago. Shut up. <laughs> oh yeah, you say that I, every time say... I every time I look at him, I, I just think back to when he was just that fresh faced kid in in San Antonio training at Shawn Michaels School. 
He's just, God, he's so good. Hey, legitimately, yeah. I know we're talking about Daniel Bryan now, and we're not supposed to talk about current stuff, but I, I had this discussion on social media recently. Bell to bell, take all the creative stuff out, take character stuff out, just bell to bell in ring wrestling. Daniel Bryan's got to be top five ever, right? He's great. Yeah, he definitely is. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd put him in the top 10, yes. Either way, I mean, I know you're, you're older than me and you have a different purview. I mean, I didn't see a lot of the stuff that you saw. I didn't see Jack Briscoe. I didn't see Dory Funk. I mean, I didn't want to, you know, go to sleep. So I, I saw some Terry Funk and I, but I saw, oh, so you just kept Funk. watching the same match of Ric Flair over and over and over again. No, that's not true. Oh, there you go. Sure. There's your no, sure you did. It was, he's just, just different opponents. Okay. I can say that. I love Rick. I say it to Rick. Okay. So hey, don't everybody get all fucking bent out of shape. He listens to the show, by the way. I know. And I love him. Not I don't on, think he's not one of the greatest of all time. Now. Rick Flair's up there in the top five. <laughs> what a controversial take that was. You know, I, it, it does fascinate me that Rick listens to our podcast because, you know, he got bored with ours fairly quickly, as you know, and he doesn't listen on the podcast app in a traditional way, but. At night, when he's like trying to go to sleep, he uh, he'll fire up the YouTube. So we put him to sleep. <laughs> is what you say? You know, Rick doesn't sleep like a normal person. All right, here comes Jake the Snake. And by the way, this is heel Jake. This is great shit. Let's lay out. I'm going to play this interview for our, our audience to listen to here. We're at 1907, 08, 09, 10, and and here you go. Here's Sean Mooney with Jake backstage. Elizabeth, Randy Savage is wired to the max. He cannot wait to get you into the ring. So. As cold as a razor blade, as tight as a tourniquet, like the skin on a dying man. Randy Savage, the last time I seen you, you were flailing like some helpless child, drowning. Drowning from what? Drowning from the very poison that was running through your veins after that snake had chewed on that arm. For some time he did chew. Now you look at my eyes, Randy Savage, and you see two black holes in the sky. But you look at that snake eyes and you'll see something so cold and so devilish and so deliberate. Yes, he takes care of what he has to, does what he has to, just like me. Your eyes, your eyes weren't even there, man. You were out, you were gone. But you know whose eyes I enjoyed the most? <laughs> Do you? Elizabeth's. Pupils so small. So intent, so scared for the man that she loved. And what a rush I got, man. Up and down my back, it felt so good. My hair felt like it was tingling. I mean, I had goosebumps all over my body listening to you squeal for a man that could not do anything but flail around. He couldn't help himself at all, you know? And see the thing about Jack Tunney barring the snake from the corner. Let me tell you something, Jack Tunney. When I was brought into this world, I could not rob, I could not steal, I could not lie, I couldn't even cheat. But boy, did I have some help learning. You have taught me so well. So you see, it is not my fault anything that I do out there. You have given me the right to. You have almost pushed the button to make me do it. You have pulled the trigger. So anything that I do is your fault. Snake in the corner. Trust me. Trust me. Let's go to Gene Okerlund. Dude, what a promo. If you're not in the loop on the greatness that is Jake the Snake, god damn. Well, you know what? Let's just listen to Macho too. No, well, I can do Macho. Jake. He's freaking out, freaking out, freaking out. Jake the Snake, you want to bring out your little snakes? Well, keep it in the bag. Because I'm going to put you in the bag after we're all done tonight. You understand what I'm saying? Your little comb latched onto my arm. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it didn't feel so good. Uh-uh. It didn't feel like the sweet caress of Miss Elizabeth. Uh-uh. Did not. Not going to go there. Uh-uh. Keep your hands to yourself and keep the snake in the bag. Don't bring it. I may make myself a brand new pair of boots. Oh, yeah. Freak out. Freak out, believe it or not, mean Gene. Why aren't they counting me down and telling me to wrap this thing up with a feather in my hat? I'm the macho man, uh-huh. 
first name macho, last name man. And I got three more behind that if you really want to know what I'm talking about. Uh huh. Yeah, bring it on, Jake the Snake. We're in Texas. Yeah, huh? Gonna put my cowboy boots on and kick your ass. Elizabeth! It's time to go on, drop down on the snake, man. Oh, freak out. Oh, yeah. It's hard to do with my teeth and my fucking swelled up tongue. Just saying. Well, I appreciate you powering through. By the way, there's so many great storylines going on here. Not just the Hulk Hogan, Undertaker, Ric Flair situation. But as a reminder, the way we got here is the ultimate warrior beat the macho man, Randy Savage at WrestleMania in a retirement match. And here he comes wham right from behind. So the macho man had to retire, but he's goaded out of retirement. When at SummerSlam 91, he gets a special present at the, after the match made in heaven, match made in hell, his wedding reception, he opens up a box. Of course, it's the snake, the undertakers there. Everybody knows it's Jake, the snake behind this eventually the snake would bite the macho man, Randy Savage, which we've talked about before here on the show, just a phenomenal angle. I mean, it looked real because it was real. And as a kid, the idea that you see a snake biting a man on TV was just fucking mind blowing. And so, you know, naturally he's, he's been allowed the opportunity to rescind his retirement to avenge this, uh, this situation. And of course we involved Miss Elizabeth, not just with the snake jumping out of the box, but also while Macho man is tied up, Jake is not exactly super polite. And I love the way they gimmick the macho man's bandage here, where he's got the arm wrapped up where he was bitten, but they've also gimmicked some blood on there where it looks like it's bleeding through everything about this man is just checking all the boxes for me. Peak WWF stuff for me. Thank God for Sid Justice. Uh Uh-huh. My favorite line of the whole thing. Sid Justice coming in and stopping that goddamn attack. Thank God for Sid Justice. Oh, yeah. No, it it was beautiful storytelling, and it was a great way to bring Randy back. Uh, Gave him a nice summer off. Came back and married his wife. (laughs) on national television, probably the best way to guarantee that something won't last is to have your wedding on television. There you no, go. I'm not arguing that. Yeah. I think it's fairly accurate. Let's talk about some rumor and innuendo here, uh, sort of behind the scenes. They're going to have uh, a little bit of time. The, the situation with their real life relationship, the macho man, of course, and and miss Elizabeth, it's been said that by the time they got married on TV, it was already a little rocky in real life. Would you think that's true? Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I would say from my experience with them and during the summer, during that summer after WrestleMania uh, seven and after I, got fired. I drove down. We spent time with them at their home and everything seemed good. I I was with them the night in Madison square garden when they renewed their vows and did the whole marriage and everything. And from an outsider, my vantage point from being friends with them outside and not being in the bubble, uh, seemed to be normal. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I don't really know. I don't know if that's revisionist theories and history, if you will. Uh, but at the time I didn't get that feeling. Let's talk about, um, the macho man's look here. Most longtime fans are, are, are thinking of the macho man with, with the boots and the small trunks and the big robe here. He's wearing long tights and he's wearing a shirt with sort of the fringe arms and he's got a jacket and a cowboy hat. He's totally changed up his look here. Conspiracy theorists would say, well, this coincides with the same time that the WWF was implementing a steroid policy for the first time. I've always thought, nah, this is just Randy wanting to switch it up and sort of reinvent himself. What say you? 
Randy always loved to reinvent himself. And Randy, uh, when Randy went from being the Macho Man Randy Savage to the Macho King, completely reinvented the way that he dressed the whole nine yards. And that's when he first started introducing a lot of this look. He had this designer, Michael, in Florida, who designed a lot of this stuff. And he wanted to change up what he was doing. So this was Randy just constantly not wanting to be stale and wanting to reinvent himself and be different, not just be be able to substitute one picture from five years ago for what he's doing today. It was kind of his theory. He always wanted to be new, and it's it's the old uh, Memphis. You know, that's kind of that Memphis attitude, Tennessee, because those guys sold their own gimmicks. Right. So they would sit out at the picture table and they would sell four by six pictures for a dollar. Well, the same people bought the shit every week. Sure. They had to constantly keep taking new pictures and change up something uh, so that those same people come back and buy new pictures and get them autographed. And really what they're looking for is the interaction with the star. I mean, it didn't matter what they were selling. They just wanted to buy it from them. Right. Exactly. But if you have something new to offer them, then a large segment of the audience is going to want that new. They want to have, okay, great. I have what's old. Now what you have that is quote old is now a collector's item. Dude, watching old Jake, the snake is just so fun for me, the short arm clothesline. And you see him working on the hurt arm of the macho man and peeling at the bandage and you know, Macho's sort of going along with it, but the minute he, Jake punches him in the quote unquote wound, Macho just loses his mind and attacks him. They're telling a great story here. Meltzer would say, you know, that the match, um, itself was only average, but the post match was pretty memorable. And we're going to see that in a minute. He gives the whole thing, three stars saying that it was two stars based on the match, but the extra stars for the post match thing. And. He even says, and this is quite a compliment from a pretty notoriously negative towards the WWF Dave Meltzer in this era. He says, um, this was just about the most dramatic angle I've ever seen. Most angles in wrestling are usually rushed through. So the needed drama isn't there. Uh, if anything, this went on for too long. Lord knows they needed something big to get Roberts over as a main event. heel draw. They did something big, but whether or not it works is another story. But what we're going to see in the post-match here is really tremendous. And, you know, I mean, look at the, look at the crowd. They're on their feet. They're ready for this. There is, this has that old, what's the old Johnny Valentine? I can't make you believe wrestling's real, but you'll believe I'm real. Damn right. And that, that's what this reeks of. It reeks of, okay, you know, Sienna and Bret Hart was a good wrestling match, but man, this is a fight. These guys really hate each other. And you didn't have to be sold that very much. Here you see they're trying to uh, stop the macho man from using a chair against Jake. Oh Roberts. my God. I'm not going to take a bump. Tony Gurria. I'll sit down on my butt. There's enough padding there. Take the bell, throw the young guys down. My God. Was that Eaton? The last one was Eaton. By the way, the first guy, one was Tony Gurria. I got that. But the guy who was. The bell keeper, uh, the timekeeper who was just pushed down is the guy who used to throw stone cold as beers. Just so everybody understands how long that dude was here. And look at this, bam, DDT out of nowhere. So in an effort to keep the macho man from, from injuring Jake, the snake Roberts with a weapon, what they accidentally do is set up the macho man for a perfect DDT and look at the fans. Everybody's on their feet. The snake was banned from ringside by Jake, to, by Jack Tunney after, you know, the, the whole snake bite situation. So, but even still people are like, well, what's he going to do now? And, and they're ready for it. No master storytelling. And I thought it was, you're watching literally two of the best of all time. Absolutely. Jake, Jake, just masterful heel baby face, whatever role that he Portrayed Jake was able to bring the audience on a ride with him without having to do a whole lot. And he didn't do a whole lot because he didn't have to. Here comes another one. Not one, but two. And and what if he's not done? 
Well, at least he doesn't have the snake. It's banned. How great he is can't... this, man? The DDT was so well established. Had there been a finishing maneuver besides Lawler's pile driver? I'm talking WWF. Had there been a finishing maneuver that the audience was sort of Pavlovian with where they knew, oh, if he hits that, it's done. I mean, they know short arm clothesline, here comes the DDT. And if he does the whole, you know, circle finger wag gimmick, here it comes. I mean, Hogan, you know, Hogan's finishing sequence, but also probably snook a splash. Um, for Jake to hit that out of nowhere, that was the beauty of the DDT. And that's what made it that instantaneous pop because Jake could hit it out of nowhere. I tell everybody what, whenever Jake was asked about DDT, Hey, what does it mean? What did he say? The end. I just think that's great. Hey, the letters DDT. Well, what does that mean? The end. And then of course yeah. he sold a shirt, you know, and, uh, in the Watts territory, was it cruel, but fair? Yes. Just, so uh, everything about Jake Roberts, when you really dig in, in this era, it's just fucking gold, man. And it's a wonder. And I, and I guess I wanted your opinion here. Why was he not positioned to do more on top with Hulk Hogan? Was it a, a money dispute? Was Jake becoming less reliable? Had the substance stuff started to creep in a little too much. Well, just based on the, the heel character work and the size, because I know people look at Jake Roberts, skinny legs, and they think, oh, he wasn't that big of a guy. He's Hulk Hogan's height. He's huge. He's Hulk Hogan. I'm six, three or whatever. He towers over me. He's got to be a real life six, five or six, six or six, seven. And he's tall. I mean, he's a tall dude. He's just as tall as Hulk Hogan. Look at, look at the way the referee even respects Jake takes the bag out from underneath the ring and throws it in the ring and the referee sells the, the bag. bag. And that's, what's great, by the way, you know, you see some people poking holes in logic of modern wrestling where they're, and look, look at the shot. Look at the way the shot's done with Liz running down. God damn. This was great. I think the best work that WWF ever did is when you weren't fucking there. Okay. I'm busting balls. What a great shot though. For them both to be in the, position. who the fuck taught him how to take that shot. Yeah. It was the snot nose from Houston. Know it all. That's me. I guess you're snaggle tooth Jones today though. No, it's in the back, man. It's just the only thing bothered me. And the tooth never hurt. It just broke. But uh, what hurts now is my tongue. It's just still kind of that flow up and, you know, from the numbing bullshit. Man, what a great scene. You know, Miss Elizabeth has already seen a, a defenseless Randy Savage bitten by a snake. She can't stand the idea of having it happen again here. So. She's here to throw herself on top of him and please don't hurt him. And they're going to milk this a little bit, of course, but what a natural story. This is like a movie right here. This is less about a match and more about a movie. They, I can't help, but see this scene and think of the whole Vince McMahon line from beyond the mat where he takes a swig of the water and he says, we make movies because that's kind of what this is. Yep. And here Jake is, you know, showing, showing Elizabeth, her husband, and he's absolutely defenseless. And here's another DDT just for you, just for you. Look in my eyes and there he is. That's for you. You made me do this. So good, and dude. And it then rolls him over. So Look good. at him. Look at him. So great. It's good stuff. Grabs the bag. And by the way, what I was talking about with modern wrestling a minute ago, People are like, why are there tables, ladders, and chairs? Oh my. And, and kendo sticks underneath the ring. But if you're a heel, it makes sense that you just slip a little black bag under there and nobody's going to pay attention to that. And they don't know that it's not extra parts for the ring or bolts or whatever. Nope. It's a fucking Cobra. It's awesome. Or is it? Or is it? It could but everybody be. knew there was a Cobra inside that bag. And when the, when the glove comes out too. Dude, just the, the addition of the glove from the normal Jake, the snake presentation. And it's not just any old glove. It's a fucking black glove because of course it is. You gotta have black glove to be able to handle a Cobra. So let's talk about, you know, the behind the scenes of this, this day, um, this is in San Antonio. So you're going to ride by and visit friends. I guess at this point, you're already working with the global wrestling federation. If you want to call it that. No. I wasn't, I was completely unemployed at this point. And you're trying to just come feel it out or visit friends or just take the temperature or 
Shit, I met Vince the first night. Vince and Pat, we went to Whataburger in Corpus Christi. You say the first and night. And hung you out. Mean, you mean the night before? Yeah. And so, yeah, we just kind of, you know, hung out. I went down to see friends and uh, beg for a job. Kind of like Jake is telling Elizabeth right now, beg me. Beg me. Beg me not to do any more. And you can hear all of it. By and the way, now he Jake's her actually the putting his hands on Liz, which had never been done before. No, watch the crowd. But people are covering their mouth and he slaps her. And look, look, look at everybody in the background. Oh yeah. The guy in the blue jacket, he's ready to go. Now, again, this bad part doesn't age well. No one should slap a woman. That's not cool. But in this era, you gotta, I mean, John Wayne, and I, obviously that's a different era. He's slapping chicks in every movie. Like it, this is a bygone era where that was more acceptable. Shouldn't have been. It is what it was. They did it for heat. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, it was a working slap. I mean, there's no way anybody's really slapping Elizabeth with Randy Savage in the ring. Come on. Especially Jake. Yeah. He, he made sure that, uh, she went down under his control. There's no snake in the bag. There's no snake. There's no snake. This is just genius. He's got the bag. He's, he's showing Jack Tunney. There is no snake. Cross my heart. And you, who, who wouldn't take the word of a snake? I mean, even in the promo that we just listened to a minute ago, trust me, trust me, dude, what a genius angle. How well done was this? I mean, I, I know that some folks are going to be super critical because of the slap on Elizabeth and I'm not making excuses for it at all. Clearly shouldn't and can't happen. Now we know better. Uh, and look at us felt Pat Patterson right there. And I think they're oh, even yeah. referring to him as Dr. Pat Patterson here. What was he a doctor of? Oh, uh, he's a doctor of, of love. Hey, just... I, I thought you were. Well, you're gone here. You... They need a new doctor of love. There you go. Gotcha, Pacious. Gotcha, Jake, Jake, Chase. Everyone asks about Rene Goulet. They always say, who's the guy with the little Dutch boy haircut? Tell everybody about Rene. Rene Goulet. He used to wear the Michael Jackson glove and would do a claw, but he never won a match. Man, Rene was French Canadian. He did, he did very well over the years in the Carolinas and up north in the old New York territory in Montreal. But Rene was a, what you would call a journeyman wrestler, but a very well respected and very nice man. It's so remarkable to me, the way this story was told and the promo that Randy Savage is going to cut in a few minutes is unlike anything you've ever seen from Randy. You've got to go out of your way to watch the interview with Jake, this match. And then the first promo with, with macho was good. But the, the second promo was on a look at his face, dude. This is, well, real. He's, this is great. He, he just is now realizing that Elizabeth is hurt and she's selling her, you know, she's still selling the slap and he's selling that he put her. Why did you come out? Why did you, you know, I, I put you in that position. Here's Jake. Let's listen to the audio. Jake Roberts am, hitting a woman. Yeah. How could you? A woman. No man wants a woman that's going to lay down and grovel and beg for somebody's life. If it's a woman that I want, I want her to stand up. Stand up and be that. Be what I want. As far as slapping her. Yeah, I no. slapped her. Oh. But I'll slap myself. I'll slap you, Gene Oakland. But I'll tell you something, Randy Savage. DDT and you was fine. That really felt good. But the best feeling I've ever had in my life is when I grabbed a hold of your woman's hair, man, and jerked her up off of her knee. Uh, that was good. And then when I put my hand across her face, my man, it felt so good I should have to pay for that. Yeah, I would pay to do that. So the next time you think about crossing this snake's path and a snake chooses his own path where nobody else wants to go, you think about it again. But if you do decide to, please do me one little favor. I'm begging you, please bring her back. Let me touch you again. Oh, get out uh, of here, please, Robert. I can cultivate her into something that even I could oh, want. Oh, please. Huh? I could do that. Trust me. Trust me. Please. <laughs> I refuse to. Gorilla Monsoon, let's get back. Get out of here. On, get the hell you. out of here. Trust him. So well done. And now 
this, by the way, I just watched this again for the first time since it happened, uh, this past week or maybe two weeks ago, prepping for the show. I had no idea that the warlord had a W taped into the back of his head or, or cutting his hair in the back of his head. That's amazing. How did I miss that all these years? Really? you never knew that. You know, maybe it was because I didn't have high definition or maybe I just didn't like the warlord. I was a British bulldog, Mark. And by the way, as dumb as this is now, and as bad of a match as this is now, this whole full Nelson, who has the, the, the battle of the full Nelson here, I was fucking into that. I mean, that's how dumb I was as a 10 year old. This is great shit. Now what's there to be dumb about full Nelson is a fucking snug hold. Well, and by the way, the warlord. Is there a more menacing looking heel? He looks like a goddamn action movie villain. Warlord looks like the, the Thanos Have in you... the, uh, Avengers movie. I haven't seen it. Um, He's the big main heel that I should give away the finish to that fucking movie. Hang on, it was hang so on. goddamn long. It was longer than Halloween havoc. What about this? Is that better? What was that? I'm going to make our fucking talk of the Avengers just disappear. Hey, why? Um, Cause fuck it. We're talking about wrestling. What are you doing? All right. So, uh, he it, looks like Thanos. Our audience will get that. You're the only one. Yeah. Got it. Um, the warlord. Great. <laughs> Mr. Perfect story. And I know you hate when we tell these type of stories, but it's famous for him telling in a shoot interview that once upon a time, allegedly. Uh, Warlord asked Mr. Perfect to, uh, give him a shot. And when he gave him a shot, it shot across uh, out of his butt cheek and across the room onto the wall and he, and perfect patted him on the back and said, you're, you're all full pal. I don't know why, but that fucking tickled me that it's almost like it's a, you know, a glass of soda or something and it overfills this look though, that the warlord has here is just unbelievable. I mean. One of the most jack dudes in the history of wrestling here, and definitely a menacing looking individual, but yet a pipsqueak manager that doesn't necessarily fit in this day, did downtown Bruno have like, or did Harvey Whippleman have naked pictures of somebody or how is he in this role here? It feels like he's woefully out of place, but managing the warlord. Big Sid Udi Sid Sid brought Bruno in and wanted Bruno to, to manage and basically kind of take care of Sid along the way. And since Sid was a, a baby face at the time, he could manage Sid. So Sid helped get him a job and Bruno was hard worker you know, still there with the company. Oh now, my God. Right? Yeah. Without a doubt. I, I'm not disparaging, you know, his, his, uh, his effort, by the way, when you take a look at Bruno on the outside, he's a big Memphis guy, of course, Sid Udy being from the part of Arkansas that's just right over the bridge from Memphis. So he grew up as uh, a Memphis guy. He's going to do the Fargo strut here in a minute. And it's a very particular style strut. And I didn't catch it as a kid. Cause of course I didn't know what the fuck a Fargo strut was, but watching it back this, this week or whenever I watched it, uh, it stuck out like a sore thumb and made all the sense in the world. By the way, unfortunately that great, we've seen two really good matches. This is going to go 12 minutes and 45 seconds, by the way. Not a bad rating, two and a quarter stars in the observer. It got the same rating as Bret Hart and the Skinner. So he wasn't necessarily terrible with it, but my goodness, was this match too long for me this week when I watched it? Yeah, I can see that, but at the same time, they're not rushing through it. They're not doing a bunch of high spots. They're actually telling a story No doubt. and they're slowing down and telling a story and it is coming right off of the Jake and Savage match. So their role here is, okay, let's settle everybody down and we'll get them ready for, you know, what's to come here at the end of the night. We should mention that, uh, the gate for this show is about a hundred thousand dollars. It does a 1.0 buy rate, which they classified as a disappointment, which we've covered. We kind of knew that because they don't even try it again for like 13 years. And then they would bring back taboo Tuesday, but that didn't last very long either. So again, not the best, uh, you may have wondered, Hey, what's a 1.0 buy rate mean? It means roughly 400,000 buys, which these days would be considered a huge success. Obviously pay-per-view is way different, but, um, 
I'm not supposed to talk about this, but there's another wrestling company that still does pay-per-view and they don't do anywhere near 400,000 buys and it's considered a success. But in this era, WWF pay-per-views were doing a lot more than that to be considered a success. You know, WrestleMania five, which obviously we're a few years removed from was just gangbusters and as was WrestleMania six. And so it was a different level of expectation. So 400,000 buys at, by the way, a reduced pay-per-view price was not considered to be gangbuster business. Exactly. And I'm just, you know, as you sit here and you, you look at this match and you kind of in your mind without having the opportunity to ever meet or talk to either one of these individuals in the ring, you would look at the warlord. He looks like a scary kind of guy. You wouldn't want not very non approachable. However, you know, of the, of the two in the ring, warlord was just the nicest guy that you'd ever want to just hang out with and talk to very soft spoken, kind, respectful, um, it's just one of those, you know, kind of quiet guys that, hello, hey, how are you doing? Oh, hey, what's going on? I saw a really cute dog the other day. Um, just, just a sweetheart of a, of a but, human but being. Pay attention to what we're seeing here, though. A bear hug. Now, again, different era of wrestling. It's a big man spot. But they're literally just standing in the middle of the ring, and Bulldog is going to wiggle his arms around trying to get the fans into it. I feel like, and again, I don't know shit about wrestling. But putting such an emotional angle, all right, you got Bret Hart out there. That's a hot match. He's doing a lot of, you know, fast paced stuff, technical stuff. It's a good wrestling match. You follow it with this big emotional angle. It feels like a big adrenaline dump. I've heard you use the phrase. Is this what Vince would have called a let me up match? Sure it is. But at the same time, it had story. So it was a completely different style and let's throwing ex- Liz in, that. you had the emotion that just kind of took that over the top between Jake and Savage. So yeah, this is, this is something to let's bring everything back. Let's settle everybody down. And the next two matches are designed just for that. So that the last match is going to have the impact that they were looking for. This is a rematch from WrestleMania. Um, so th- this is well established now for months and months. They've, they've talked about it on TV. You've seen it on house shows. Um, so yeah, this does have some story to it. The whole idea of, you know, let me up really didn't click for me until maybe five years ago when I heard, uh, our great close personal friend, Michael PS Hayes on a podcast with Steve Austin. And he was talking about a match and the way to tell a match and to tell a story that you make fans, you know, who are seated, stand up and then sit back down and stand up and sit back down and stand up and sit back down and putting them on this emotional roller coaster through the course of a match. And when I really heard somebody explain that for the first time, one of the next matches I saw live was Kevin Owens right after his debut with John Cena. And I really had an appreciation for why people called John Cena, big match, John. Cause you go back and you watch that. And there were so many moments that were up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. I found myself sure enjoying the match, but I was also watching the crowd and I could see the way they were doing exactly what Hayes said, made a great match up, down, up, down, up, down. And I really, I don't know that I understood sort of the let me up match until I understood that you can't do that. Every single match you've got to have matches where you could just say, Oh, fuck. That was, that was a roller coaster. I just, I need a break. I need an adrenaline dump here for a minute. Well, the, the entire show is a roller coaster. Hopefully if it, if it's good and you want to take people on an emotional roller coaster ride, not just in each individual match, but throughout the body of a show, whether it be a three hour show, a two hour show or a marathon pay-per-view you, you hope that you're going to give your audience a chance to kind of regroup a little bit and settle down and get their beer and their popcorn and be ready for, for the next one. But you still, you still want to enjoy what's on the screen and you still want to be invested. Maybe not as much as the bigger matches, but it's just, you, yeah, you're letting them up. You're letting them breathe because you can't, 
you know, there is an analogy sometimes when you look at, you can look at every, at any and everything. And I like in everything to sex. And it's kind of like you can just put your dick in and come for two hours or you can take them on a ride and you can take them out to dinner and you can hopefully go in for a kiss and then maybe you can cuddle on the couch and you can start making out and you can have a little foreplay and then you have sex and then you reach a climax. You know what's Versus, funny is, is I've only heard one other person in wrestling talk like that and compare it to sex and it was Jake the Snake Roberts and you know, I know that's not sort of PC to talk about and make comparisons to now, but I do think it's a fair analogy. And, and even when I was young in my sales career, I'll never forget, man, where I was, I was in a sales meeting. I was probably seven, maybe I was 18. I was very, very young in my sales career. And this sales trainer came in from another part of the country. And you know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, this guy knows everything. I mean, he's had all the success. And he made the exact same analogy you did, except he talked about when you were going for the clothes and in sales, going for the clothes is, is like, you know, building to a finish in a match. And he, he clapped his hands and he's like, now when it's, when, when you're about, when you're, when you're ready to go for the clothes, it's just like sex guys. That's when we really start fucking. And he did his hands like that. And I'm like, oh my God, I get it. And now to hear that that analogy exists in wrestling too, because that's when you're really building to the finish. It's, it's weird how that analogy works. Is it not? It is because most people can identify with it and relate to it. Sure. So it, it's, it's anything that you do, you know, for example, you, you want to go to a great Broadway show. I mean, it's the whole, how am I going to get tickets? Then getting the tickets and actually getting the tickets in your hand, the trip to the show. And then the curtain comes up and you're, you, you can apply it to anything, but the simplest, most, you know, male chauvinist, barbaric way to do it is the way that I just did. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, that's, you know, not PC talk and not something we can talk about outside this podcast, but fuck it. We give you guys the real shit here. Well, let's talk about formatting a card. Fundamentally, I heard Dusty Rhodes once upon a time equate building a wrestling card or a wrestling show to the circus. You got to have the clowns. You got to have the lion tamer. You got to have the trapeze artist. You got to have the jugglers, whatever the shit you've got something for everybody. It's like a buffet style. There's something for everybody. How much of that exists in wrestling today? I think a lot of it still exists. At least it should. And there are different philosophies as far as do you start with a big bang or do you start slow and build? Um, I like starting with a bang and finishing with a bang. I like a beginning, a middle and an end but giving them something in the very beginning that is like, okay, wow, man, I'm glad I tuned in for this. And then start taking them on a, on a roll, let them up, bring them down, you know, get them back up, let them down. Um, but I like starting up. I like starting out with a big bang. And the start of the show is to me equally as important as the close of the show. You start big and you start hot, by God, that just sets the tone for the rest of the show. There's the crucifix and that's it. And by the way, the crucifix as a finish, the first time I remember seeing it again, I'm 10 years old. I really thought British Bulldog invented that because I didn't remember seeing that anywhere else. I know now he didn't, but that, that finish, that crucifix. I did right after I invented the headlock. Again, our crucifix, I think is just underrated, uh, a few weeks ago, I know we don't talk about current stuff, but a few weeks ago on the way to survivor series, uh, Rhea Ripley slid in when, when Charlotte had the figure eight on Sasha banks and it looked like Sasha was about to tap and Ripley just laid an arm over, laid a leg over. It was a natural transition to a crucifix and the internet blew up with what a genius finish that was. I think the crucifix is a, is a woefully underrated finish. All right, here we go. What a great piece of business. This is about to be Sean Mooney 
is uh, bringing it back. And here's the Macho Man. I've got to play this audio just so you can hear it. Here we go. <laughs> Randy Savage, I'm just as upset over what took place out there as you are. The greatest Elizabeth. The greatest Elizabeth. Elizabeth. You understand that? The greatest Elizabeth. Snake degraded her. Yeah. And I'll never forgive myself. It's the worst day of my life that I let him do that. You laid your hands on Elizabeth. You laid your hands on Elizabeth. It's my fault. It's my fault. Man, you told who said you said something about hanging with you, show you the dark side. Let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something right now. Let me tell you something right now. I'm gonna get you, man. Yeah, I'm gonna get you. And there ain't gonna be no stopping me, man. I'm gonna get you. You can trust me, I said that. You already got what you wanted here. You know, I didn't even get a piece of you. I didn't even get a piece of him. I blame myself. Man, I'm telling you. Touched Elizabeth, man. Touched Elizabeth. Unbelievable, man. That's it. It's over. It's over. No control, brother. Man, I'm telling you right now, man. I'm going to get you. Man. I'm going to get you here. Yeah. I'm begging right now. You made her beg, huh? You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm telling you something right now. <gasps> I'm gonna get you! And I'm telling you something, man. I'm telling you, it ain't over. It ain't even started. You understand that? You understand that? I blame myself! I'm gonna get you. Yeah! Get out of here! My, Honestly, a very. My God, what a performance. You know, the. You have to watch this. Uh, I hope. Hopefully, you're not just listening to this, but Macho Man wasn't doing his standard right in front of the camera, pointing at it. He did do some of that, but going down on the ground, just distraught, like, dude, one of Savage's best promos ever. And I don't feel like anybody talks about it because it's not your standard promo, but I think that's what made it so great. What made it so great was also the fact that that was probably the first time that you were able to hear Randy vocalize that he cared about Elizabeth. Yes. Great point. So that brought you in because you didn't get the normal macho man stuff and you were able to feel what Randy was feeling for years and years. He would be very dismissive and rude. He's a heel of course, but it was like, he was too cool for school and she's lucky to be with me. Cause I'm the macho man. This is the first time that you see it. Not just, you know, will you marry me? which is like, okay, I guess I'm going to do this, but this is him pouring his heart out to the camera, really a masterful performance and followed up by the fucking repo man. Yeah. There's Virgil. Yeah. No, not in Tito, not just Virgil. It's the matador and Virgil, uh, Tito Santana here is El matador, which I got to admit I liked better. Because I, I came into the game of, of being a wrestling fan when Strike Force was broken up and I never saw Tito as a singles really much before besides the whole random Ariba and I just whatever. But this was like, well, that's a fucking cool gimmick, man. He's a bullfighter. So I understand at this time there was a lot of occupational gimmicks. That one was one that as a kid was like, Oh, that's actually pretty cool. But the repo man, even as a kid, I was like, Well, this is just fucking stupid. Especially when I know, even as a 10 year old, this dude was one of the most badass motherfuckers in the league when he was part of demolition. How would you know that he's wearing a mask? Well, because the fucking paint would rub off. Don't be a dickhead. He he's looks, wearing a mask as repo man. No one knows who he is. He looks like a jack leg hamburglar. But we know where he comes from because of the license plates on the back of his jacket. Dude, I got to tell you, I just saw those and I didn't remember putting that together before. I knew this jacket said Repo Man, but I didn't know that it was cut up pieces of license plate. And I mean, I remember the shoulders being like tire tread or whatever, but my God, this was like Randy Savage in here with just warmed up leftovers. Not Randy Savage. You know what I mean? Ted DiBiase. Ted DiBiase is still the million dollar man to me here. 
and that's a big character. And, and, and the million dollar man was always a big character to me, but this is like, well, this is retread Tito Santana and literally retread demolition smash and fucking Virgil. Can you believe yeah, Vir- but Virgil and DiBiase was hot at this time? Okay. It wasn't to me, but I understand what you're saying. And you know, they, they'd had that relationship of being on the same side and sure. Virgil had just, had just turned at WrestleMania. So it was still fairly fresh with DiBiase and Virgil. By the way, I can't believe this is real life, ladies and gentlemen, but as much as I want to shit on this, cause I do, uh, this is the highest rated thing on the show so far. The f- according to Dave Meltzer, Meltzer gave the first match two and a quarter stars. Then he gave Randy Savage at three stars, which is just fucking way too low. Bulldog and Warlord, two and a quarter. And now this one gets three and a half. This is the highest rated thing on the entire fucking show that can't be real. Well, again, that's giving validity to a completely invalid source. Well, let's talk about what the readers of the Observer thought. They too thought it was the best match. It beat everything else. The worst match was Warlord and Bulldog, which even Meltzer's rating didn't agree with. Uh, when it came time to actually voting the show, thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle, 57 and a half percent gave it a thumbs up. 40.1% gave it a thumbs down 2.4% thumbs in the middle. Clearly the 40, 40.1% thumbs down were not Hogan fans or not Savage fans or not Jake fans. But if you were a kid or fans of any of those guys, this was a fucking thumbs up show. And let's talk about this too. If you were in the crowd that night, you saw a lot more than what we saw here. The undercard of this show is, is really loaded. The Harris brothers, Don and Ron Harris were in the opener and they got a win over some guys named Brian Costello and Brian Donahue. Then a wrestler named Sir Charles, who would go on to be Papa Shango. And of course the Godfather, he beat Dale Wolf. Then Chris Walker beat Brian Lee, who we know is going to become the under faker and primetime Brian Lee in ECW. And then back again in the DOA as chains. Then Chris Chavis, who we know is going to become Tataka, beat JW storm. Then Greg Valentine beat the Brooklyn brawler. Then the nasty boys who are well-established stars here beat the bushwhackers. And then the Legion of Doom beat the Beverly Brothers. Come on now. That's big time. And then we had Ric Flair and Roddy Piper. That's right. Ric Flair and Roddy Piper wrestled on this card, but it was dark. It's for the house only. And I understand in this era, you couldn't give away everything on pay-per-view. But man, I would have been great with just Slide and Repo and Ted DiBiase out of here. And let's slide in Flair and, and Piper. That would have been badass. Yeah, but it was only an hour and a half show, and it was one of those it's experimental okay. deals. Let's let's experiment with a shorter show. I, I'm sure it was a cheaper price. Absolutely. You know, normally you had pay per views. You know, in this era, were uh, you know 1995 to 2995. Occasionally, you see a 24.95. This one is a reduced price, uh, similar to what you guys would do. You know, what four years later within your house. So this is sort of the precursor for in your house and very much experimental because it's on another day and because it's on another day and you got to keep this in mind, you don't want to keep people up as late because they've got work and they've got school the next day. And in this era, a lot of your WWF pay-per-views were afternoon shows. They didn't start super late like they do now where it's become more commonplace and acceptable for them to be later. Man, DiBiase was just a fucking worker and a half. He's got to be on everybody's short list for best wrestler to never have a, a world title run. Wouldn't you agree? Because he didn't need it. No, I, and, I and, and, and here, when you sit there and watch this, everything that Virgil is doing, this is the painting. It's being painted. The artist in there is Ted DiBiase. Of course. I mean, he is the, he is the master artiste of the, of the crew. I want to ask you about something. You and I haven't, haven't talked about this, you know, since you're working 21 hours a day, we don't get to talk as much as we used to maybe, but I did a podcast with Arn Anderson recently. And he talked about when he came over to the WWF in 1988, he was used to sort of the Jim Crockett style of working. And that came up because I asked what was the difference between working in front of a JCP crowd and a WWF crowd. 
And he said in JCP, we tried to get everybody over. We tried to the NWA. We tried to get everybody over. We tried to make everything competitive, make our opponents look like a million bucks, no matter what. And Barry Darso, of course, had been in that, that style of wrestling when he was in the NWA and Jim Crockett promotions, of course he played a Russian character, but then when he comes to the WWF, he hits it big as demolition smash. And man, that was not the case. So even though Darso was real life, really good friends with Marty Lundy, AKA Arn Anderson, when he gets up there, the brain busters find themselves working, uh, with Paul Roma and Jim powers and Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson did what they did in Jim Crockett promotions. And they gave those guys a lot and made a very competitive match and made it look great. And it was a very good match. But when he comes through the curtain, Darso pulls him aside and says, what the fuck are you doing? You don't do that here. You're getting ready to come with us. You eat those guys up. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the concept was it was a different style because we're not angling always for let's make this the most competitive match we can. We're angling to get somebody over as a badass contender for the title or a badass champion defending or whatever the case may be. Can you speak a little bit as a guy who came from a more territorial system to the Vince McMahon WWF presentation where there are, for lack of a better word, and I don't like this word either jobber matches. Well, I, I don't like the word either. To me, they're enhancement talent. And without the enhancement talent, you wouldn't have stars. Correct. But that's how you build stars. If everything's 50-50 and everybody is going out and getting everybody over, at the end of the day, nobody, nobody gets, gets, over. gets over. Yeah. So it's about making stars, and it's about going out and shining and taking care of your character. Then when people pay to go to the live events and they are watching a pay-per-view, that's when – you see a star versus a star and that's your opportunity to sell and to do some of those things. Television was used as a commercial. So that was the time that you had to get your character over and make people want to see you against perceived better competition in the live event. Uh Uh-oh, Tito fell down. Let's talk about some behind the scenes stuff. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just going to say, and and the unstated star on that team, Sherry Martell on the outside, God, she was just fabulous at everything she did. Let's talk a little bit about that because I do think Sherry is really one of the unsung heroes of wrestling where I don't know that she gets her just due and maybe she never really will, but she is, she's working her ass off and she put so much thought and effort into everything she did, even when she was in the background during interviews in this era, she feels like she's got to be movement. She's got, she's got to create, you know, facials and she's moving her hands and she's pacing back and forth. And there's a lot of thought and effort in the makeup presentation and the dress and the glitter in the hair. And, you know, she's constantly pounding on the mat. She is earning her money here for sure. I just find that to be fascinating because. I feel like a lot of times, some of the best managers were wrestlers before, you know, we've talked about the fact that Bobby Heenan was a wrestler before he was there. And, and, you know, obviously there are exceptions to that. A Jim Cornette comes to mind, but Sherry is, is the female equivalent maybe of a Bobby Heenan. Am I wrong on that? She is because Sherry never did anything to try and get over the guys that she was managing. Sherry enhanced the talent that she was managing and didn't get over bigger than they did. I'm glad you clarified because famously, and he's talked about this on his podcast before he didn't have a podcast now, but once upon a time, uh, a wrestler named Don Callis, who, uh, was a part of, um, gosh, what was the name the truth commission? He managed the truth commission. He has said that your criticism when you guys were going to let him go is that you said you're getting yourself over at the expense of the talent. Some of our listeners may not know exactly what that means. Can you sort of go into the weeds a little bit about what complimenting a talent compared to competing with a talent would mean? Well, uh, simple as cutting promos and talking about putting your talent over instead of yourself. You're talking about how great they are and selling them instead of trying to sell yourself is the, the greatest mind in the world and so on and so forth. And you cut the promo for them, not for yourself. 
and stealing scenes in a match and trying to be the focal point of the match, taking people's attention from what's going on in the ring to you on the outside of the ring and whatever antics you may be doing at the time. So that's the mark of a, of a good manager and, and someone, you know, you're not, Sherry's not out there stealing the show. Sherry's up here for a spot so that when you, you see it, it's special. It's one time. She wasn't up doing this all throughout the match. And there are managers who think that they have to be involved in every little thing. And it takes away from the match in their talent, the guys that are actually in there doing the work. And there you go. DiBiase steals a win. Even though Sherry hit him in the head with a shoe, Darso nails Virgil with a knee in the kidney area. That's enough. One, two, three. Your heels are victorious. And apparently it's good enough to win three and a half stars. Next up man is such a special match, such a special moment for my fandom as a kid. I mean, I remember being in class on the way to this show, talking about it with my friends and it was such a big deal. You know, the undertaker had been on the cover of the WF magazine. Hulk Hogan is peak Hulk Hogan. And a lot of guys in the business joke about having a Hulk Hogan 1991 level 10. Check it out right there. We're going to play the audio from this Hulk Hogan interview. I know Bruce is going to cut his mic off. We'll lay out and let the Hulks or Mean Gene do what they do. Sting Federation title. Well, you know something, Mean Gene. As far as me and all my little holsters go, brah, this is going to be the greatest, the happiest day in the history of this beautiful thing we call Hulkamania, brother. Oh, yeah, and Survivor Series, me and all my little teeny holsters felt the Undertaker slowly stalk Hulkamania. We felt him slowly squeeze the life and breath out of Hulk Hogan, brother. But after Ric Flair interfered, man, after they dropped me in the tombstone right on the steel chair in the one, two, three was like the shot that was heard around the world. The real survivors were all those little teeny Hulkamaniacs out there, brother, that as they saw Hulk Hogan wrenching in pain on that canvas in the center of the ring, the real survivors were the little teeny holsters that still had their heads high, brother, that still had smiles on their faces and still believed in the four demandments of the training, the prayers, the vitamins, and believing in ourselves. And because we believe in ourselves, Jack Tunney took recognition immediately and rebooked this match Tuesday in Texas, brothers, with Jack Tunney watching our back, Hulkamaniacs. Ric Flair, stay out of my face. It's between me and The Undertaker. And as far as all my little holsters go, I'm Hulk Hogan, brother, the designated hitman for all my Hulkamaniacs. All these years I've been leading the pack, and I promised to all those little holsters that stood by me in the Survivor Series that this Tuesday in Texas, when the largest arms in the world, brother, come crashing down on The Undertaker, the WWF title will be back right where it should be, right around the waist of Hulk Hogan. And Undertaker, what you gonna do when Hulk Hogan buries you right here in Texas? <laughs> All right, let's get... My God, what a promo. And what a way to end it. <laughs> Great stuff. Uh, Hulk Hogan, I don't care what anybody says is the fucking Babe Ruth of wrestling. Like I feel such a connection to Hulk Hogan because as a kid, I wasn't a, a comic book fan. So I wasn't a super, I mean, I tried comics. They just weren't for me. Nothing wrong with them. Just say it. I wasn't a Superman guy. I wasn't a Batman guy. I was a fucking Hulk Hogan guy. So that's my real life superhero right there. And what a great shot we see here with uh, Paul bear. And by the way, once upon a time, another famous, very tall wrestler would say that he made dragging the belt to the ring famous long before Steve Austin. I think the undertaker has something to say about that because here he comes dragging the belt to the ring. And we've talked about, you know, how you got him into the company and, and your whole idea and the, just the development of this character. And one year later, here he is. This is a guy who talked about on Steve Austin's podcast on the WB network, the broken skull sessions, which I highly recommend. Uh, it should have been called dead man talking, but whatever, um, that he wasn't sure what they were going to do with this character and, and, and wasn't sure what, how he was going to be, what his character was going to be. He had been mean Mark Callis for the NWA and WCW and, um, 
Ollie Anderson famously told him you, nobody will ever buy a ticket to see you wrestle. And now here he is as the undertaker and he has the top belt in the entire industry worldwide without question in December of 1991 and has the distinction of being one of two guys to beat Hulk Hogan for the belt. The other being the ultimate warrior who's no longer here. Of course he was sent home after SummerSlam 91. You see the fans going wild here. But this match is not without controversy. Of course, at SummerSlam or Survivor Series, rather, when Hulk Hogan is up in the tombstone position, the Undertaker is ready to pile drive him, drop him on his own head, as they say. Ric Flair sneaks in, slides a folding chair underneath, and, and it makes that pile driver even more devastating. Not just a regular tombstone, but a tombstone on a chair. And I can't believe this is real, but, uh, Dave Meltzer actually wrote about this in the observer and said, Flair then put a chair in the ring and undertaker gave to a Hogan, a tombstone pile driver on the chair for the pin. When watching the show, I thought the best work of the entire show was Hogan selling the tombstone after the match was over. It took him several minutes to get to his feet and he looked really groggy and his selling was completely realistic. As it turns out, he was really injured, apparently by the tombstone on the chair. After viewing it back several times, it does appear that Hogan's head never came near the chair. However, Undertaker may have jammed Hogan's neck with his knee since Hogan was hospitalized legit all night long with a jammed neck. Yeah. I think, and I could be wrong, but I believe the rumor and innuendo is that the undertaker being a relatively young guy in the business and really excited and proud to have this opportunity, just one year in the company after being told a year prior, you'd never sell a ticket in the business. He flew his whole family to survivor series to see this big pay-per-view to see this big match against Hulk Hogan because he knew the creative. Oh my God, I'm beating Hulk Hogan on pay-per-view for the world wrestling federation title. And there's a little bit of a stink on the title win because afterwards Hogan legitimately allegedly feigns an injury and goes to the hospital. And when you watch the replay back to Meltzer's point, he's nowhere near the chair, but Hogan that night convinced everyone, no, he's legitimately hurt and went to the hospital and it sort of put a stink on the title win and the big proud moment for the real life Mark Calloway. And I don't know that Ho that Hogan and undertaker ever really saw eye to eye ever again, according to the rumor and innuendo you, you weren't there, but you, you were around both of these guys for a long time. Tell me what you heard about survivor series 91 and what you remember about this match in particular with maybe that being the underlying heat between the two. Uh, I heard all that. And I watched it back several times and it looked like, uh, that taker probably could have gotten run over by a Mack truck. And he had such a tight hold of Hogan that there was nothing that was going to happen to Hulk. Um, it is what it is. And it couldn't have looked safer is the point. And when you go yeah, back to me you, yeah, and, and to taker, and I think that it was, I think that knowing taker, he would never, ever intentionally hurt anybody. And certainly he was going to be extra careful that night with the Hulk golden Hogan. Goose. The and, golden goose. you know, it looked good to me. By the way, look at the tremendous work of the undertaker here, doing the choke and rolling his eyes back into his head. If you haven't yet, I can't believe I'm advocating this because I wanted so desperately a star cast to have you get dragged these stories out of the undertaker. It wasn't to be, but. The, the broken skull session, which I can't put over enough. When you're done with this, go watch that on the W network. It's phenomenal. Undertaker talked about how, when he became this undertaker character, he had to sort of change the way he thought about wrestling, what he could do and what he should do became two different things. Yes. He can run the ropes real fast and jump real high for clotheslines, but would the undertaker do that? And you really saw the undertaker as a character and Mark Calloway as a performer doing the undertaker come into his own in this first year, because you see how slow and methodical and almost 
Michael Myers and Jason, you know, the, the real horror movie film franchises, you see how slow he's working. You go back and watch him as mean Mark Callis, totally different presentation. He's clicking on all cylinders here. Is he not? Absolutely. And it, that just goes to, to the talent of Mark and just how good he really was that he was able to adapt. And we took all of the things that he did extraordinarily well, and we would incorporate them into the match at the right point. Suddenly. So he would work very methodically and slow, but when it was time, just like in a movie, he's on you. Exactly. And he would turn it up and you'd go, holy fuck. Where did that come from? That's what made him so dangerous. And that's what made him so appealing to the audience. This is such a phenomenal, you know, pay-per-view to me because it, I was at maybe the peak of my fandom here from a WWF standpoint, because I couldn't believe somebody finally beat Hulk Hogan, um, in real life. And I know I'm probably putting you in a spot here to betray some confidence as a peek behind the curtain, but that's the format of the show. Do you believe the undertaker had some animosity to Hulk Hogan for a certain period of time? Maybe not today, but once. Yeah, time. definitely. Yeah, I think he did. I think that, you know, in, in his, to him, this was the biggest moment of his career. And, and, um, I think that, yes, he did. So. The undertaker's contention is that Hogan wasn't really hurt and he was quote unquote working and shitting on his big moment. I mean, do you believe that? In I don't I, uh, see. I don't think that Hulk was shitting on his moment. I just think that, you know, whatever happened, happened. And again, not being there, I've never talked to Hulk about it. So I, I don't know. Um, that's the thing. Like, I don't want to believe that about Hulk because. I mean, you've talked about this before with other interesting polarizing characters in wrestling. I tend to treat people the way they treat me. And he's always been, and I'm talking about the, I mean, Hulk Hogan. So cool to me. I can't imagine that he would be intentionally shitty to anyone. Right. I understand that in the course of business, sometimes business is business, pal. Goddamn. I get it. Whatever. Um, but it doesn't feel like something Hogan would do unless, and we've talked about this before, you know, when. When Owen Hart kicked Shawn Michaels in the back of the head, Shawn Michaels went to the hospital that night and faked injuries and worked the hospital. And guys, the NWA did that too, where they felt like it was necessary to sort of keep kayfabe. So on the one hand, maybe you think, well, Hogan's just trying to keep kayfabe and really sell the angle that the only way Hulkamania could really get beat is if he legitimately injured him. But really the worst or maybe one of the worst, one of the two worst things that a wrestler can do is earn a reputation as being dangerous as someone who's not going to take care of you, someone who will hurt you. And, and, and to have a little bit of that stink on the undertaker character, just one year in not good. Right. Yeah. And I don't believe that, that there was, I really and truly don't believe that anybody thought that he was dangerous in any way, shape or form. Did you ever hear again? Nobody told me this. I'm just asking questions to my friend. Did you hear of Vince admonishing the undertaker after the match? Or I mean, was he cutting a promo on him? Like, how could you? God damn it. You've killed the golden goose or whatever in real life. No, no conversation not, like no. that happened. Nope. Okay. Nope. Not at all. And I think that they, they watched it best of my knowledge that they watched it back and went, okay, let's go find out what happened. But, um, I don't think that anybody anybody thought that taker was dangerous by any stretch of the imagination. We should mention that, uh, Meltzer was freestyling in the newsletter that Dale Wilkes was probably going to wind up coming here. Um, do you remember you were at least friendly with Dale? Do you remember Dale being discussed as a, as a possibility of coming in here? Cause we wouldn't see him here for what, like six years. No, uh, I don't know because I hadn't even started it. I knew Dell from his stormtrooper days in AWA when we had reached out to him before, but um, I hadn't even started in global yet, right? Global yet. So Dell was still still doing well in in global, and it was actually well, that was ugly. Um, it was actually at it was this evening 
um, in Texas that I got the phone call from Paul Heyman telling me that Eddie Gilbert was taking the book in global and wanted to bring me in after the first of the year. Do you immediately run the events and say, by the way, I just got an offer to do this. Do you want to hire me now? No, he had already told me I wasn't coming back. Owen Hart's going to come in in January. Uh, He'll be teaming with, uh, Jim Neidhart, according to the observer. Let's talk a little bit about, um, as random as this sounds here. I just feel like mentioning it because I loved what we just saw with Randy Savage and Jake Roberts. And I feel like that, that angle is still, still stuck in all of our minds. If we grew up with it one month after this, the rockers split up on the barber shop. There was man, the WF's best shit happened when you weren't there. You raggedy rat soup eating motherfucker. Yeah. I suck. Hey, so let's talk about, um, the, the Kevin Von Erich situation. I don't know that you were plugged into any of this, but I can't help but ask. He has a tryout match while you guys are on. Well, while the company's on this loop here in Texas, do you remember having a convert? Carrie's already in the company, right? As a Texas tornado, but Kevin Von Erich, do you remember anything about him being discussed? Maybe you weren't with the company, but you heard about it with, uh, with WWF. No, I mean, through the years, there have been different times they talked about Kevin, but I don't think ever that it ever got serious. It's just fascinating to me because we never saw it. Here we go. You know, what's coming here comes Ric Flair, baby blue robe. Uh, I don't know what Flair's doing down there by God. Hulkster. That's right. Undertaker. Yeah. Take that pal. Your friend's down at ringside. I, I don't know if he's going to be able to help you this time. Tunney's down there, too. Look at the Hulkster go. Yeah, nature boy. Interestingly enough, one of the only robes that Flair had that said nature boy quite like that. Uh, that one sold on eBay years ago for a fraction of probably what it's worth. But l- watch what happens now. The Undertaker... Does the old flipperuski to the outside after Hogan was hulking up? Hogan grabs a chair, nails Flair with it in the back. Flair collapses on Jack Tunney. That's going to be important for what we're about to see. This is uncharacteristic of what the, the typical Hogan, Hogan Hulk up because we had a bit of a pause, a running forearm, some extra stuff in here from what you would normally get in a Hogan Hulk up. And it's because they're trying to sell the story that he can't get the undertaker down. No, he can't by God. Did you prefer undertaker with gray or purple? Gray. I did too, but I think most of our listeners are big purple guys. I see more people talking about, you know, the purple and black more than the gray and black, but I think this original gray and black, it's good stuff. So as a reminder, the chair is what flair slid in to beat Hogan the first time. And there you go. Instead it hits undertaker. And of course, Hulk gets the clothesline on the apron and he goes big boot. You know, what's coming next. Yeah. But the chair didn't take undertaker down that damn leg drop. The big boot did. And notice that again, the Hulk up has changed the whole routine. Instead of hitting the leg drop, he got the throat thrust. Undertaker back to his feet. Not your typical situation. Now we're going to tease the old traditional spot with the oh. manager. Oh, Paul bear gets the eyes raked big punch for his trouble. After the Undertaker got hit in the face with the urn by Paul bear. Now the urn has been emptied, which they want you to forget and ashes from a dead man thrown into the dead man's eyes. One, two, three. There's your schoolboy. Jack Tunney saw it all happen, but he's not happy. But it doesn't matter. Hulk must pose brother belt shot to the head. Took care of him on that up and over. He goes Hulkster celebrating, but he's going back. He is, but he saw the urn and he released. He saw the urine, the urn. Oh, I do think it's fun that for years we never knew what was in the urn. There was even a time where it was just a light that shined around. But the original undertaker, nope, it's a dead motherfucker. These are ashes. And you'll see Hogan, when he starts posing, he's got the soot on his fingers. And you see Jack Tunney talking to the referee, Morella here. 
and you know, something's up, but they're not exactly addressing it. But at home, you get the idea that, uh oh, the president of the company, the commissioner, he's not happy about something, but it won't keep Hulkster from posing. Check out the, eye, the soot on his fingers. The oh. goddamn soot. That could come from anything though, Conrad. No, I'm just saying it's clearly not uh working ash. That's shoot ash. Oh yeah, definitely. That was, that was the dead guy in there. Oh, I didn't mean that. Come on. I, you know, I just mean, goddamn pal. I get cold. Let's burn a fire. No, that was a dead guy. Oh, sure. Yeah. I, that was the Memphis territory. That's actually Jim Hurd down there. <laughs> uh, so listen, that's gonna, that's gonna wrap us up for this Tuesday in Texas. What a phenomenal pay-per-view this was. I'm sorry for fanboying out all over this one. I couldn't help it. It's such a great show. I really enjoyed this one. You watched it this week for the first time in a long time. You're with me on this, right? This was a great show. It really was. That was a damn good show. And and I know that, you know, there will be some folks who, who, who take issue with the fact that we're saying this was a good show because, oh, it was only an hour and a half or this thing or that thing or whatever. But my goodness, what a story they told. And, and it was not too long. And I feel like, you know, sometimes Monday night raw is a chore to get through because it's three hours. And I know you're going to disagree with that, but I'm just saying as a wrestling fan, an hour and a half, man, that's a sweet spot. I'm, it leaves me wanting more. I don't feel like, oh God, I'm exhausted. I got to go to bed. I'm like, man, I wish there was a little more. And that's what I feel like with today's show. I just thought it was tremendous. And I hope you guys did too. And I hope that you're excited for next week because we're going to cover something uh, that we, uh, we haven't ever covered before next week. And we're going back to 1999. It's going to be around the 20 year anniversary of Armageddon 1999. Do you remember anything about Armageddon 99? Cause you name one match. I mean, listen, it all runs together on some level. Could you name one match from Armageddon 1999? I could cheat, but I would be not being honest. So. Okay. I do not. Let's get to it. Here's what we're talking about next week. And, and as a reminder, uh, that show went down on December 12th, 1999. So we'll date, we'll be one day later than the 20 year anniversary, but it's the acolytes, uh, in there in a, uh, tag team battle Royal and, um, the Hardy boys will be the last ones out. Kurt angle and Steve Blackman will have a singles match. Here's probably one of the more famous matches on the card. Miss Kitty. BB ivory and Jacqueline in an evening gown pool match. You know, what's happening there. We got the Hollies taking on Rikishi and viscera. We got Val Venus in there in a triple threat for the European title with the British bulldog, who is the champ and D'Lo Brown. We got Kane and X-Pac inside a steel cage. We got a singles match with Jericho and China, which I know we've talked about. We've got the rocket sock connection taking on the new age outlaws. We've got big show and the big boss man for the WWF title. And then a no holds barred match in the main event, two of your great close personal friends, triple H and Mr. McMahon. If triple H wins, he becomes the number one contender for the WWF title. And if McMahon wins triple H and Stephanie would receive an annulment. And I can't believe this is a real number, but Vince is going to wrestle a 28 minute match here. That's what we're talking about next week. Armageddon 1999. Man, I hate to be that guy, but wrestling was just more fun in 1991 than it was 1999. Is that because I'm 10 or was that's because you're 10? What was this Tuesday in Texas? Just that much. Come on. This Tuesday in Texas was better than Armageddon 99. Was it not? I don't know. We're going to find out. We will find out next week. And we appreciate you joining in this, this week and every week. Tell your friends to hit the subscribe button and let them know that something to wrestle is still, and I I confirmed this week, Bruce, I haven't even told you this. We're still the most downloaded wrestling podcast in all the land. And that's because of you guys who've supported us from the very beginning. I hate to be a little, uh, I don't know, reflective here, Bruce, but on the heels of Thanksgiving, I feel like I can't be, I can't not be. Can you believe all that's happened? Not just in your life, but in my life. And it's all a result of this podcast. Is it not? It's been a hell of a ride. It has been a hell of a ride. And we appreciate you guys supporting us. None of this would have been possible without you guys. Uh, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we hope that you enjoyed this one and watched it with your heart and got back in your 10 year old mode. Like I did today and 
Maybe if you're a little younger than me, you'll get in your 10 year old mode next week with Armageddon 1999 right here on something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Shaka Khan. In Pancho Villa, he is going to be taking dinner reservations between 9 and 14. <laughs> 